So, Mike or Grady, let's cancel. I'm not sure what you would like me to do. Yeah, I realize that. So we have walked through 1-1. One, one. Um, you could ask for minor changes. Uh, I don't think are reflected. Uh, no, I have a 2.1. Okay. Um, I don't think I sent it to Laura. Right. Um, yeah. So basically what you had requested was to reflect in the finding section that there is currently a wanton waste prohibition for migratory waterfowl um, and then to make some conforming changes in those findings to reflect that. So I added a subdivision in the finding that says Vermont prohibits wanton waste of migratory waterfowl as required by federal law. And then I made some, they're kind of tweaks to say that Vermont is not fully compliant with the North American model of wildlife conservation and that they're not in full compliance. And so it's just kind of, it was more of adding that reference to the migratory waterfowl wanton waste prohibition, which is effectively the language in the bill as introduced. Um, and then making some conforming changes to the findings. I'm sorry, when you say it's effectively the language, the, the federal wanton waste is effectively the bill as introduced. Yes. <coughs> um, it's about waterfowl, not all wildlife, but it still has that requirement to make a reasonable effort um, to, to retrieve, etc. Okay. Great. Um, does the committee have questions for Michael? Representative Bates. So over the weekend, I was pouring over all this stuff. And I understand what a strike call is now and everything. And being new, I had to ask this question because I am new with this. Can I strike something out of here? Yeah, you can propose to the committee to do, to change this language however you want. So I would just like to let everybody know that I have a copy of the North American wildlife uh, conservation model. And when I was going through this, they copied pretty much word for word um, number five on this, which I'll read real quickly. In North America, individuals may legally kill certain wild animals under strict guidelines for food and for self-defense and property protection. Laws restrict against the casual killing of wildlife merely for antlers, horns, and feathers. So if you go to your 1.1 and read line 1 through 13, you will see that that... On page 2. Yeah, on page 2, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. And page 1, starting at 17, line 17. And just so that people know that this North American Wildlife Conservation Model is a guideline. That's all it is. It was uh, Teddy Roosevelt and another guy put this out back in the 1800s. So do, it's, a, uh, it's a guideline. That's all this is. It's, this isn't set in stone. It's like something else that we follow. Um, we do follow certain other guidelines, but we don't make laws off of this. That's all it's trying to say is we don't make laws off of this. And you know, and then I was looking at what does casual killing mean? You know, back in the 1800s, when you're on your horse and there's a billion buffalo out there, and you just casually kill a buffalo, I can. That's what that means to me. It doesn't mean that you know we're out here in Vermont right now just shooting at things. We don't do that. So I would really like the committee to take a look at what I propose is if we strike all this out of there, and then we can look at the bill again. So we're not exactly doing markup, but that's a proposal. Right, that's a proposal. Um, any questions for Michael? I have, I have no question, but uh, I would like to uh, address what 
Representative Bates has just said, and that is that uh, there are people in this room that are, you know, really against anyone going out in the woods with a gun and shooting anything, even if it was legal, all right? So you have to have that mindset, all right, of what's going on in this room right now. They're trying to change the rules of hunting in Vermont, for one thing. And uh, this is why I'm opposed to this bill. So. Uh, well, I just a clarification. What were you suggesting? That we eliminate out of this one one bill uh, on the first page, seventeen through twenty, and then on the second page, one through thirteen. Question for you, um, Michael. Based on this this suggestion, which which um, I understood had a, its basis for concern, is making this law. Um, could you could could you help us with what the findings are and what they are? regarding um, law? Finding sections are not binding law. They are um, an expression of the intent or purpose of the General Assembly and why they are enacting a law to follow the findings. Um, and as such, they're not, then how are they published? They are published in the uh, white books, not in the green books. I don't think you have copies of the white books anymore after the mold scourge. Um, <laughs> they uh, are used by courts as to determine what legislative intent is, but they are not binding on a court uh, in the interpretation of law. Right. Um, and so in, in, in my lay, my my lay interpretation um would you agree that that or disagree that my lay interpretation is their rationale for doing something they're not they're not the law at all they they are not uh what i would call law they well technically they are law because they are enacted as part of an act but they are not binding right okay um what the courts often have called them before is truisms, mm. that, that, that they, they stand for just what they say, but they have no binding effect beyond that. Um, and our office has a policy that they need to be supported by evidence um, or some factual basis. Um, so, I, all of them are based on a, a factual documentation, except maybe the subdivision four um, and subdivision five isn't. The last, the last finding of any finding is basically what you want to do. Uh, are, you, are you looking at two one or one one? I'm looking at one one. Uh, the, Generally, the last subdivision in any finding section is an expression of what you want to do based on the, the previous findings. So I would say that, that most of these findings are based on fact or documentation that I can provide to you. Good morning. Good morning. 
Um, I guess my question is in regards, I like your opinion on um, page three, line seven on defense of personal and property. Um, when I looked at state statute regarding hunting, um, there's section uh, 4716, excuse me, let me repeat that, um, uh, 4828 which addresses the taking of wildlife that causes damage to property. Is this necessary or can you reference 4828 to illustrate this already in statute giving the public the opportunity to address um, and potentially remove wildlife that are causing damage to property, sure. such as gravel? Uh, you could do that. Um, there's more than one statute that that references the defense of property, the uh, authorized taking of game in defense of property. There's the deer doing damage, the bear doing damage. Um, so there, there are others. If you wanted to cross-reference, you probably want to cross-reference okay. all of them. Okay, I thought that one was more of an umbrella one. Sure. But, um, but I, I think it's helpful maybe to cross-reference to show that there is an inherent interest to support the property owner's interest to protect person or public <coughs> already in staff. Yes, uh, on page two, Michael, uh, line 14, when it speaks of full compliance, it's the fact that the state lacks uh, a lot on what and waste. Uh, the only reason why it's not, we are not in full compliance with the uh, American model of wildlife conservation. I, I can't say, I, I can't e answer that at all. I'd have to go back and look at each of the principal. I didn't do that analysis. Um, I was looking over the weekend too at other what other states are doing. It was surprising to see, even beyond the list that you provided, the number of states that have a, some sort of wanted waste. Uh, Utah, Colorado, Florida, um, and and I think there's a. It, it, it's fundamentally it, the impression I got is that it's trying to address, not the issue related to law-abiding hunters that are um, stewards of the land, making, maintaining the, their heritage, but it's really to address the uh, and enable the game wardens to seek out those um, un unfortunate few that are, um, are conducting a wanton waste or destruction of wildlife for various reasons. And when I looked at what Colorado and Utah's language is in particular, it, it implied that they were concerned about the removal of heads or, for trophy. Um, they were concerned about endangered, threatened endangered species taking. Um, they are concerned <coughs> about um, the, um, just the, you know, a waste of, of wildlife just generally. Um, because of the whole construct of, of the intact, sustainable ecosystem. And so while I, I, I appreciate what um, Representative Bates had done in terms of trying to think about um, what would be the most appropriate finding to help base something like this, um, I couldn't help but turn to the values of, of and the concern of, of, again, of poaching just generally. And, um, of what other states have done in terms of what the purpose of a bill of this sort. So while it may not make sense to address a 100-year-old set of uh, a model, um, it, it is helpful, I think, for the general public and for us in terms of what we're trying to accomplish is to better clarify the purpose of the bill so that the intent isn't to, um, to go against hunting. The intent is to provide our game wardens 
the opportunity to ensure that we are giving them the tools they need to address um, those actions that go against the public trust documents as uh, doctrines as it pertains to wildlife. And so, so I, I, I welcome the thinking about how would we then articulate in a finding those per that purpose if it's not to identify this model it should in my mind identify those overarching values of hunting being a part of our heritage as well as the concerns about stopping poaching as described in Utah stopping the protection of um, uh, destruction for trophies and they and in Colorado they spelled out um, the wasteful destruction mutilation for the heads hides claws teeth antlers horns internal organs and others being taken in, uh, for abandoned and then the final point I just want to make is that um, it's unfortunate in, in this international <coughs> situation we are in markets that there is a black market for trade of animal parts and their internal organs typically. They go across, um, unfortunate to um, other places outside the US for various uses. And, um, and that's probably something that, that the um, late President Roosevelt hadn't envisioned. Certainly we hadn't either. And I think that was the intent too of some of the, um, the states that too embrace hunting as part of our heritage are trying to address as well. So uh, I think you have many options for how you tailor the bill. Um, as you noted, some states are, are specific about the, the trophy aspect or the, the valued aspect of it. And some states uh, define their law around leaving the edible portion of the, the animal there. Some states are focused um, pretty specifically on big game. Um, some states apply it to any person. Some states apply it just to a person engaged in hunting, trapping, or fishing. Um, so I, I do think you have options for how you want to do it. And then the purpose that, that is for you to tell me what your purpose is. Uh, I understand fully your argument, and I, I can come up with language on that if the committee wants me to. Several people have have uh, suggested to me that, and I have I I have said to anybody who will listen, this is not about sportsmen and women. This is about non-sportsmen and women, people who are not out there revering the wildlife, um, taking them for a real purpose, and enjoying the the. Uh, the Vermont landscape <coughs> and habitat. It's about the non-sportsmen and women. So then, um, people, several people have, <coughs> have suggested to me, but likely these, we'll just call them bad actors, um, don't even have a hunting license. So what good is putting 10 points on something they don't have? Um, and uh, the, the, so the question that I have is in order to to honor the concerns of people who are legitimate hunters um, that have a concern about hunting licenses being um, hunting licenses being uh, attached with points um, 
could we assign points to the drivers to a driver's license instead of a hunter's license? Um, and would that then uh, and, and, and the result of that then would be um, uh, if you don't have a, light, a hunting license, you get up, you, uh, your your penalty goes to your hunting license and or to your driver's license. Uh, is that is that cross cross discipline uh, finding, if you will, or penalizing uh, possible or appropriate? Um. I can't comment on if it's appropriate. That's that's a decision for the legislature to make. Um, legally, you have done that for um, issues such as domestic abuse, domestic violence, where you or other crimes where you suspended a person's license or put points on their license because of their engagement in that crime. <coughs> The Judiciary Committees have recently been looking at that and and um, have been trying to move away from that concept because of the limits it puts on persons in rural communities and their inability to access jobs, mm -hmm. daycare, schools, yeah. etc. cetera, um, and kind of the cycle that it creates. So yes, you can. Do that. I would want to coordinate with our transportation and motor vehicle attorney about that and our judiciary attorneys, but I think you could do that. With that said, uh, a few years ago, the department came in, it was maybe more than a few years ago now, um, fish and wildlife violations are criminal violations, and most of them except for the minor violations, are adjudicated um, at the criminal division of the Superior Court. The problem that the department was facing then was that state's attorneys, because of the workload that they had, their caseload, were not prioritizing fish and wildlife violations. So if someone wasn't paying their ticket on their waiver, um, there was a backlog of fish and wildlife violations, and, and specifically, from my recollection, that the concern was that there were certain frequent violators whose license was suspended who just kept violating because there was no repercussion to them. Uh, to address that, you gave the, the department um, administrative penalty authority uh, and <coughs> kind of, I wouldn't say you beefed up their seizure authority, but you kind of reaffirmed their seizure authority. Um, and uh, that, was, that was done to address that situation of the repeat violator who didn't care about points on the license. Okay, thank you. The only uh, problem there, uh, Jim, is uh, you're not going to prevent people from driving. I spent 30 years in the Department of Corrections. Somebody wants to drive, they're going to, every day in the paper you, you read where the guy was under suspended license. So I, I don't know what impact this is going to have. Well, well, well taken. Yeah. Okay, okay I'd like to um, <coughs> move on to the next one. This is possible. Go ahead. I'll be very brief. On um, page three, you list uh, a number of, of um, situations in which it's beyond the control of the person. And if I may suggest adding to that list uh, language that the state of Ohio uses in addition to these, which talks about uh, in the time in which a person reaches a point where he or she has no permission to be, such as on a refuge. Uh, a border of a refuge or private property um, and where they can go no further without committing you know, hunting without permission or, or trespass. So if, um, I think that too would indicate where it's beyond the control of the person. 
Okay. I'm sorry, could, so you want that to be an exception? And now item number five, and then with, where they cannot salvage the oh, understood. property understood. would be a situation where they're understood. out of order or yeah. um, where, the, where they have the no authority houses. to enter onto the property because yeah. it's posted or otherwise prohibited from yeah. there. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Lewis Porter, Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife Department. I apologize. I have a little bit of bronchitis, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me okay. Um, I also uh, just want to let the committee know I'm, I'm testifying from draft 1.1. I haven't seen 2.1. So if, if there are things that I'm testifying on that are addressed in 2.1, in just please point that out to me. That would be very helpful. Or just understand that I'm going from 1.1, not, uh, not having had uh, 2.1 last night when I when I drafted my testimony or took my notes. Do you have a copy of it now? I, I actually don't have a copy of it yet. Okay, we can make sure okay. you get one. Terrific, thanks. Uh, is there an extra one around? Right there. Uh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Representative McCall. Um, so first, I just want to say thank you very much to the committee for uh, appreciating and understanding the original draft was really not, not workable and, and working with uh, Ledge Council to draft this new version. Um, and, and, and I see the, uh, the fingerprints here of a lot of the issues that we've talked about. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through the bill and then and, and make a couple of points and, and at, frankly ask a couple of questions and then, and then we can have a discussion about anything that the committee would like. Um, there, there seems to be some, there seems to be some um, misunderstanding or confusion about the North American wildlife model. Um, this is an aspirational set of principles that has guided wild, successful wildlife recovery and that's very important to agencies like mine and, and agencies like it around the country. Uh, but they are, like, like anything worthy of aspiring to, they are very difficult to achieve all of those principles uh, and to meet all of those seven guiding principles. And I don't believe that there's a state in the country that, that meets all of those. And, and we certainly don't in Vermont either. Uh, and that's something we strive to do in our regulations uh, at the department and board. But for instance, uh, one of the principles is elimination of markets for game. Uh, and certainly every country, every state in the country, as far as I know, has either fur markets for trapping or game farms uh, for, for big fence <coughs> hunting, uh, something we don't, we don't have in Vermont, but they do in many states. Uh, they have uh, wild animals, wild species as captive of captive animals. So I think it's just important to note that these are a set of, of guiding principles and not a set of regulations or, or laws. Um, to that, uh, I would suggest uh, that, that in places where you're finding, say, bring Vermont law into compliance, that you say something like, I'll align Vermont law more completely or do, do better to align Vermont law with the North American model. Um, because it, it's not, it's not a, uh, first of all, they evolve. And, and second of all, they're not a set of draft regulations they're, or laws. They're, they're uh, really more aspirational in, in nature. Um, in, in, on page two in, in, uh, in sub three, um, there are a number of reasons outlined in, uh, in the, the non-frivolous reasons for, for taking wildlife. I think there's an important one here that is not included in your in your list, and that is just fostering the connection between people and their landscape and their environment. That is a huge amount of what hunting, fishing, and trapping is about, uh, and I think it's a non-frivolous reason. I think it's an important reason, and and frankly, any deer hunter in the state of Vermont can go to Costco and buy pork at much much lower time and cost than it takes for them to harvest venison. Meat is an important part of what we do. It's uh, a driving part of it for some folks, 
but really that, that connection to the environment, to the landscape, to wildlife is really the reason, the, the main reason, or one of the main reasons that people do these activities. Um, uh, in the next uh, <coughs> sub four, uh, I, I heard uh, uh, Councilor Grady explain that the, the version 2.1 includes the waterfowl uh, regulation. I think it's important to note that there are three other places currently in Vermont regulations where there are wanton waste uh, rules uh, of various kinds, which I pointed out to the committee in my prior testimony. These are uh, around black bear harvests, moose harvests, uh, taking uh, fish by spearing. These all have elements of wanton waste principles into our regulations. In addition, as we rewrite the deer regulations, I anticipate that we will propose uh, a version of that in the deer regulations also. So I just think it's, I appreciate noting the waterfowl one. There are uh, these three other current examples. Um, yeah, going down to section uh, section two um, and lines, uh, let's make sure I'm seeing lines here. So now lines uh, 19 and, and 20. Um, I, uh, I think that I would suggest eliminating the wall hunting, fishing, or trapping uh, and make this apply to anybody who intentionally kills wild animals. I understand the chair's concerns or, or questions to me in my testimony last time about uh, people driving and, and whether that's really the same thing, but that's not intentional. Now that you have this intentionality included, I would say why restrict it to hunting, fishing, and trapping? Um, so I just put that for the committee's consideration. In addition, uh, in above where it says wildlife and in this section where it says wild animal, um, I would suggest to the committee that they make this apply to game species. Uh, and the reason for that is I think it, it is, makes it much more enforceable, makes it much more uh, possible to be administered. And if you look through Councilor O'Grady's very helpful comparison of various states' uh, wanton waste laws, I think you'll see that virtually all of them restrict what species these apply to in some form. They do it different ways, but I think uh, there, if, if there's a one in there that doesn't restrict it in some fashion to not all species, I would be surprised. Um, I, I, I have to admit, I, I've not gone back and looked at the original statute. Um, I'll let you continue. Sure. Thank you. Um, Representative Dunn, thank you. So on the uh, on page three, um, where you address the the uh, the uh, things that would make uh, make someone exempt from this requirement, I, I found the defense of person or property a little confusing because these other categories of things are reasons that you might want to, you, you might be prevented reasonably from retrieving game and this defensive person or property, you would have no intention of retrieving that game necessarily. So I, I just think that's a little different than the other exemptions in this string, if that makes sense to the committee. And, um, so in general, um, I just want to make a couple of final points. Uh, in general, um, as I pointed out, I think this is, is fairly different than most of the other statutes. In particular, I understood that the, the Alaska statute was, was a, a model for this. The Alaska statute restricts uh, this to game species. It has a, I, I believe it has a criminally negligent standard uh, with, rather than the lower standard. I think that this, that this law applies uh, somebody who's uh, a, a actual lawyer and not uh, just one who, who plays on TV like me. I would, could tell you that much better. Um, and I'm, I'm unclear in the Alaska, I haven't had a chance to reach out to my counterpart in Alaska. I'm unclear in the Alaska model how they deal with uh, species like grizzly bears and wolves, both of which are hunted, uh, neither of which is commonly used uh, for meat, uh, and which I, I, I'm not sure, in, just in reading, uh, plain, plain reading of the language, I'm not sure how they deal with that. Uh, you know, in, in both those cases, uh, typically uh, hide or maybe head, maybe uh, paws are taken. Uh, but that would definitely, I would say, fall into the trophy category. And I'm not sure, people don't eat grizzly bears commonly uh, as they do black bears. So 
So I'm, I'm not sure how they address those issues under the Alaska statute. And I, I apologize for not having an opportunity yet to reach out to my counterpart there. Um, a couple of issues that, in, that have come up in discussing this with biologists and wardens within my department. Uh, wardens uh, routinely uh, instruct people who have shot rabies vector species that they believe to be sick. Uh, they routinely instruct them to bury those animals if there hasn't been any contact with a person. Uh, and I'm not sure, I, I think that your exemption to health and safety would have covered that, but I just wanted you to know that that's fairly common practice for wardens to tell people, if you, if you see a skunk that's acting strangely and you shoot it, you use a shovel, bury it, make sure there's no human contact, and, and that's it. Uh, we don't always collect those animals for testing unless there seems like there's a reason. And I just wanted to make sure that would be uh, covered. Another question I have uh, about this draft is um, we, we often advise hunters, especially bow hunters, uh, that if they shoot a deer to not pursue it and try to recover it immediately. Uh, in some cases, if that's close to the end of legal shooting hours, we advise them to go the next morning and recover it. Um, and I, I don't know if that would be a violation under this statute or not. Obviously, it wouldn't be your intention to do that. The last thing we want is somebody to chase a wounded deer uh, before it's expired and, and push it farther away, maybe make it impossible to recover it. Um, and so it's, it's generally uh, accepted in good practice, uh, as I say, to, to approach it that way. I understand that, that a, lot of, uh, a lot of the impetus or, or interest in this measure, in this bill, is around coyote hunting and crow hunting. And I, I'm not sure uh, whether the committee intends to capture those species and to uh, render a, a lot of coyote and crow hunting uh, to be under violation or whether you don't. And so I just think that's a question you have uh, to answer from a policy standpoint is whether you want to largely prohibit uh, a lot of coyote and crow hunting, which occurs now. Uh, do you want people to do those activities, uh, return those species to their, to their residences or somewhere else that they have control over? and then discard them, or do you intend them to only take those species uh, if they're going to use the pelts or eat them? Um, I, I'm just not sure about your intent. I think that's a, a question, excuse me. I think there's a question for you to answer. Um, it's also important to note that uh, we, we already require that people, effectively require that people retrieve game species because you, any species that has a bag limit, you have a duty to, and uh, in, in a tagging requirement, you have a duty to tag and retrieve and report that a that animal. So all the big game species report that animal to a to a check-in station. Uh, so I just wanted you to know that that's already on the books. And in addition, uh, the wardens have prosecuted at least some of these types of cases under the littering littering law. So people have hung deer longer than they should have. The deer is spoiled, N not their intention maybe, but deer is spoiled. Those people have then dumped the deer uh, you know, without using it, without harvesting it. We have on occasion prosecuted those cases under the littering law. It's obviously not a perfect fit, um, but we have done that in some cases. Lewis? Yep. Um, would you rewind to the previous one? I think I might have missed it, the one about before the littering. Um, the crow and coyote? No, back those two. Back oh, so, yes, yeah, so we require that those, for those species that have, uh, you know, you're required to report the big game species, you must retrieve and report those animals currently because once you kill them, you must tag them, you must report them at a, at a station uh, or you'd be in violation. And so that that piece is is sort of covered. It doesn't mean that we don't also need a wanton waste uh, provision of some kind, either regulation or law, to address uh, some of these issues. But I just, people do have, you know, you can't shoot a deer and decide you don't, you're going to leave it in the woods. Uh, we will find you, and we will ticket you for that. Um, very quickly, uh, I appreciated uh, Representative McCullough's driver's license suggestion. Um, it sort of fits into in keeping with my my idea that this should not be restricted to hunters, anglers, and trappers. Um, I don't know if driver's license is the right mechanism or not, but I appreciate that the, the thought that this should uh, be broader uh, to, to other people who, who intentionally kill wildlife and leave it. Um, I think I answered Representative Lafave's question on, on whether we're in compliance with other aspects, other principles of the North American model. 
Uh, and I also appreciate Representative Dolan's acknowledgement that it, we, we don't want to put hunters in an ethical bind where they shoot an animal, it dies on posted property, and maybe they go to the, to the homeowner or the landowner and ask for permission and are denied. Then they're in a dilemma. They can either be an unethical hunter by crossing into posted land without permission, uh, or they can be an unethical hunter by being in violation. So I appreciate that. Um, so that's my that's my testimony. I'm happy to discuss any of this or anything else. Well, the bottom line for me is, will the department support this bill? Uh, I I think I've I've under the 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 concerns and questions I've outlined. I don't think we'd support this draft. Uh, I do think it is worthwhile to consider how we can give wardens the ability to prosecute egregious cases of this kind of activity. In fact, we spent two years trying to come up with a regulation uh, that would would do everything we wanted to do and not do things we don't want it to do. So I, I, I do think it's important, um, but this draft I think has, has a number, has a ways to go, I guess I'd say. What's, what's the percentage of uh, poachers that, that the uh, department catches? We don't know because we don't know what's out there we don't catch. Um, I can tell you that we have a, a better rate of, of finding and prosecuting people than you might think because you think, you know, if somebody's out in the woods alone hunting, who's going to ever know? Well, people will inevitably say something to somebody and that person says something to their kid and their kid says something to some other kid at school and pretty soon there's a warden at your door. So we are, uh, I think, quite successful in prosecuting po poaching cases. We certainly don't get them all, um, but we, the wardens are, um, are community police in, in, the, in the, I think, the best sense of the word. They're out there in the grocery store and gas stations talking to people and hearing stories, and they get, they get, they get a lot. Representative uh, McCullough. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Bates was a <coughs> Um, I understand what uh, deer, bear, and moose are classified in, in Vermont as big game. Where does the crow and the coyote, what are they classified as? They are neither large nor big nor small game, I don't believe, under Vermont, under Vermont law. Yeah. Sure. Just, I have a quick follow-up here. Do you need a license to take them? You do, yep. Yeah. And we've, we've moved in the last few years, we moved a crow season out of the nesting period. Um, we, we have a crow season that lasts uh, seven months, eight months, Mark? 72 days. 72, okay. Uh, and it's, but it's spread over the year, but outside of the nesting period. So we do have some regulations on crow hunting. Representative McCullough. Um, a couple of, a couple of questions. Um, in addition to, I uh, just pick right up on the, on, on, on the license to, to shoot crow, and you do have a crow a season where it is legal to shoot crow? We do, and it's it's basically the weekends out of the nesting period. Uh-huh. And, and um, this also, I guess, you know, kind of goes to your question, what's the intent of this whole thing? Is it to, um, uh, another way to, to protect crows, protect, it's not the right word, maybe, shoot crow and coyote and and um, so my answer because I've been asked that no it's about the wanton waste of all animals um, <coughs> with that in mind um, during the times that it is legal to shoot crow um, and and you are a, li a legally licensed hunter um, would 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 a wanton waste during that time period? How would that how would that play um, with, with 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 the shooting of crow? Is there a is there a bag limit for crow? Um, There's not a bag limit. Um, the population has grown a little bit in the time that we've had regulations on the hunting. Uh, I think about three percent over the last couple decades. Um, so crows are hunted uh, primarily, I'd say, for, for two reasons. Uh, one is farmers sometimes enlist people to hunt them because they're having crop damage. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is just because of the activity. They're, they're, they're very smart. They're hard to hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's one of the reasons that people hunt them. I think yeah. if under this bill, if this bill were to apply to crows, 
people do not generally eat them. Uh, although I, I do have an old, I have, I, I have an old recipe. <laughs> I, I have also metaphorically, but not, not at, uh, actually. Um, I, I think what we, you would see happen is people would probably retrieve the crows they shot and put them in their compost pile. Yep. And I don't know if that's use or not. Yep. Yep. I'm, I'm not sure if that's use or not. Yep. Um, yeah, I, that's really for you guys to define. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so th that does create somewhat of a massaging issue, um, I suppose. And, and should we develop a coyote hunting season, which we do not have now, um, would also create this sort of massaging issue about either bag limit or well, what you do with, with the, the dead bodies, which have no real value because their pelts are... Well, they have real value in the winter, well, the, um, but in the summertime, yeah. yes. Um, well, I think you, whether you have a coyote season or not, I think you still need have to address that coyote issue and what your intent with this bill yeah, is no. towards that species. Yeah. Because they are not, they are not generally, the pelts are generally not used in the summertime when right. they're not prime. Right. So, okay. So, um, <coughs> could you, would you, you made the assertion that in a way, um, we have wanton waste around bear, deer, and fish spearing. Could you uh, could you explain that better? For me? Sure, absolutely. I uh, I have the language here. Um, uh, the in, under the moose regulation, uh, and I apologize for not sending this ahead of me. I, I will send it to you uh, after I leave. Um, under the moose regulation, we, we require that people bring the uh, bring the parts. We, we specify what parts of the moose must be returned out of the woods. Um, and I will send you this rule. It's a little bit convoluted, so I'll send it to you. And we require that they bring in uh, female reproductive tracts, <coughs> proof of sex, all edible portions, including the organ, uh, not including organs. Um, moose head, hide, lower legs, boned out rib cage need not be reported, um, but both central incisors must be presented. So we basically s specify what people have to bring out of the woods, including all edible portions. Mm -hmm. On the spear, <clears throat> on the spearing of fish, we we were concerned when we passed this rule allowing spearing of fish that people were going to spear the allowed species. <clears throat> excuse me, the allowed species. And we're going to then dump them at the access area or wherever they were, where they're fishing. So, um, we say, a uh, person who takes a fish by handheld spear, spear gun, bow or crossbow with line attached to arrow, in accordance with 122, shall keep the fish in his or her possession until the fish is permanently removed from the waters of the state and used or disposed of properly. <coughs> Excuse me. So, I, you could argue about what disposed of properly is. I'm sure that in some cases, uh, when people are spearing large carp, some of those end up in compost piles. As you know, as a gardener, you know fish make pretty good fertilizer. Um, is that used properly? In our definition, that would be used properly, and, and, and we would leave it pretty open uh, to how people use that. <coughs> in the black bear regulations, um, uh, the black bear carcass shall be field dressed prior to reporting. That is to try to get at the the concern that that a large, heavy animal like a black bear, um, in especially in that early September season, if it's not field dressed, it may spoil before it can be used. Mm -hmm. So we require that people field dress before they report to the reporting station. <coughs> so that's you know that's a different. These are all different approaches based on the different species and the different way they're pursued. You already know about the waterfowl uh, uh, federal requirement which we've adopted. And, and, and in no way, no, I won't, I won't make that assertion. I'll ask you, so a, a wanton waste bill similar to the one that we've got, is that, is that, in, is that in conflict? Would that be in conflict with the various aspects of the different um, species you have uh, wanton waste-esque? Not, not not necessarily at all. No, uh, and and neither. Just like if we were to pass other board regulations that addressed other species, it wouldn't be in conflict. 
And my last question um, that I can dream up at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it builds on uh, Representative Terenzini's question. And of course it's, it, it could be speculation, but um, on your part, but and, and would depend. And I get that. But so far, I, uh, I think that you've been asked to react to drafts that we've presented. And, and the department hasn't, re hasn't chosen to be supportive of these drafts as written. Um, I, and I can't speak for the committee, but I almost desperately want our department to support this concept. And, and it hasn't in the past been unusual for you and, and other commissioners to work with our council to create legislation that works yep. for them and and then it's up to the committee to decide if it works the committee. Um, would you be willing to do that if asked? We're, we're cer of course, we're certainly willing to work on anything the committee asks us to work on. My only caution is we spent <coughs> two years trying to develop a rule that answered all of these questions on every species mm -hmm. and weren't able to get to a consensus with a with a working group. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it, it's as, as you guys are all uh, experiencing, it's complicated and there's a million questions mm -hmm. and, and separate issues that need to be addressed. I'm happy to work with Ledge Council or anybody else um, that the committee would like us to, uh, but I, but I, it, you know, it, the, the, the nuances and the complicating factors are many. Yeah. Yep. So you have made some suggestions that, that, um, that would appear to be good language changes and additions and so on. And, and um, if, if you did network with council to, to make those changes and suggestions, um, um, you already have now a a working group <laughs> that will put thumbs up or thumbs down right. on that and it won't take a bunch of months it'll just take so so that part of your problem has been solved <laughs> and then there's 180 people who have to make that decision again uh, so um, thank you for for, yeah. for that for that offer um, and we could only see where it goes if, if you get asked well uh, <clears throat> we'll make some suggestions uh, on on this draft um, and yeah, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Representative Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, you know, um, I grew up at a time when Vermont was a good deal more rural, and consequently had a lot more farmers. And uh, as teenagers, we used to go out and shoot crows and shoot uh, uh, woodchucks. Uh, a lot of times, we're invited to do so. Pretty much new, and we buy a field and saw a little check. Uh, now the state has changed pretty dramatically since then. And I'm wondering if, uh, uh, if you're seeing now less, less shooting and less hunting of those kind of um, uh, types of wildlife that used to be commonly referred to as farmers. And is there an indication now that? There's less of that going on as far as the, the actual shooting of them. But secondly, is there any kind of indication that uh, uh, that we need a law that will prevent that, or is the culture more or less taking care of it in terms of how it has changed? Yeah, great questions. Um, I, this is anecdotal because we don't require those species to get reported, um, but I would say anecdotally, yes. Uh, the, the, the small farms are are going away as you note so we may have just as many acres in, in production or close to but by fewer farms um, those those that's resulted I think in a shift from people shooting woodchucks crows that they see um, and to the professionalization of those larger farms using uh, people whose job it is including USDA Wildlife Services to to handle a nuisance species um, so I think there is a there is a, a decline in that type of activity, um, and I, I I know from talking to both hunters and 
and uh, farmers that although it still goes on it's less less common um, and and an increase I would say in the professionalization of dealing with nuisance uh, nuisance species um, <clears throat> I don't think the the removal of nuisance species for farming will ever go away entirely uh, because there are still a variety of species uh, which including species we do regulate which cause damage to farms and which are removed or, or sugaring operations or forestry operations and which are removed for those so I don't think that will ever totally go away but I do think that there's a, a decline in the in the uh, in the do-it-yourself approach when did you step uh, when did the department put a season on crows I'd ask Mark to answer that. It's always been there. Mark always Scott, Director of Wildlife. It's always been there. It's a migratory bird uh, regulated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. What we did do recently, and I, I don't remember the exact year, it was together, but recently, within a few years, we changed the hunting season on them to move them out of the nesting season that our own research you know, found after we studied it a little bit closer, working with people who do a lot of birding. So that, that's, that was a recent change, um, and we're limited the number of days that, that hunters can hunt crows in the state. So we formed a work group to do that. So does it stand from its federal status? Correct. As a migratory bird? Correct. You it's, know, not, it's not handled under the migratory waterfall status. Well, I raise that because, you know, <coughs> around the table when he was a commissioner, has mentioned crow and coyote in the same breath. Yeah. And yet, although we have a season on uh, crow, we have none on coyote. Yeah. And that doesn't, is that because that doesn't enjoy the same sort of federal designation? Most likely, yes. And, and the crow falls under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which is federal legislation in all the states. And I, I did reach out to my counterparts in the Northeast about crow hunting uh, within the last couple of years when we redid our season. because They had to do the same thing. And, and I asked them whether there was any intention of, of enacting more regulations on statewide for crow hunting. And, and I got a, a negative response from all of them. One final uh, question, Commissioner. Um, do you think this bill requires a, a, a criminal provision in order to be a I, you know, I would actually defer that to the colonel if I could, sure. uh, given that he, his his folks actually do the enforcement. So, Colonel Batchelder. Uh, colonel Batchelder, director of enforcement, Fish and Wildlife. Um, if this law is to be enforced as written, uh, or even with future amendments. And wardens would need the ability to enter property. If that's denied, they're going to need warrant ability. For that to happen, we'll have to follow crime and criminal procedure, which a warrant would be required. Um, so yes. So that's a yes. That's a yes. If if you wanted it civil and find these cases as we may, and, and rely on rely on consent and and opportunistic enforcement, civil would would cover it. Um, it would certainly be less intrusive. I've noticed over time that there seems to be an increase in population of ravens in our area anyway. Are they considered part of the crow hunting or are they a separate entity? They're, they're protected. But they are protected yep. all yep. year round. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, my, um, question is twofold. One is that, um, in your mind, I <coughs> I think, and I'd like your opinion on this, that we should, even though we, while we have language in the Vermont Constitution about hunting, um, one element that we had in here on page uh, two, line eight and nine, where we, again, emphasize Vermont's proud history and constitutional right for hunting and fishing. Uh, in your mind, um, I would like to see a finding to to, um, to include that oh, and one of your opinion on that that's my first part of the question now, I think we where we talk about earlier we talk about uh, obviously the, the public trust related to wildlife but to, to explicitly state about that I think might may be helpful for here as a finding I, I think it's always good to affirm the importance of those activities okay my, my second part in here is that um, we received a number of comments about, well, who decides? Who decides about what is wanton? And here we don't explicitly talk or, and we just assume that it would be the Commission for Fish and Wildlife as delegated to the game wardens 
in your mind, would it be helpful to actually explicitly state that um, the, the jurisdiction over the interpretation of this language would fall on, on to the department and the game wardens? So I, I think it depends on what the committee wants to do. Other wildlife laws are able to be prosecuted by statewide law, by state law enforcement officers who aren't game wardens. Um, it, the reality is we know that 99.99% of these cases are going to fall to the warden, so I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing to, to, to do. But I would add one other thing, which is I think not only who makes the judgment, but on what basis they make that judgment is important. So is that to the, to the, in the eye of a reasonable person who's familiar with hunting and fishing, is that to a, to, uh, uh, to a, uh, you know, what, what standard do you want to, that to apply to and on what basis do you want that judgment to be made? Thank you. Uh, Representative I'm going to show my ignorance fish and game laws here because it's been a long time since I was a hunter and I, I never, you never have to worry about the deer population when I was hunting I had no effect on it. Uh, and, and years ago, and this is I have some questions, but one of them, there used to be a bounty, I believe, on porcupines, 50 cents. You bring the deer into the town clerk and you get 50 cents. <coughs> yeah, we had a bounty both on porcupines and on bobcats, believe it or not, at one point. And neither of those exist anymore. Uh, as far as coyotes are concerned, and that's obviously coyotes and crows are the thing we've heard the most about, uh, there is no season no legal hunting season for coyotes? Correct. Like most states, we have an open season, 365-day season. So you can, there is a season, but the season well, is... They're, 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 yeah, days. yeah they're, they're legal to hunt, but you have to have a license, you so, have a license. But, you, but there's no closed period. So if, if a warden got a call, <clears throat> someone had just shot a coyote and walked off and left it, what would the warden do now? Right now, there, there, would, there would not be a penalty for that. Okay. They would just... Unless, unless they shot it from the road uh, or on posted land. Uh, because shooting from roads is illegal. Yep. Or, or if they shot it with a light at night. Okay. Right. The season's okay. 24 hours a day. Right? It, it's open all day, but you can't use a light. And you can't use a night vision scope that casts a beam, even if it's not detectable by a human eye. If I, I think that probably there are very few people here on, uh, on our committee and in the room who would uh, <coughs> think that shooting an animal, uh, catching a fish and throwing it on the ice to not, not be used, uh, I think there are few people here that would feel that it's the right thing to do. I think most people feel that it's the wrong thing to do. It's, we have to try to come up with something here that will try to satisfy mm -hmm. both sides if that's possible. Now, when there was reference earlier from uh, Representative McCullough on the council, what's the difference between the council and the state wild fish and wildlife board? The, I think I believe he was referring to ledge council. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Right. Okay. Gotcha. So if, if this committee was to add to this bill and instruct the Fish and Wildlife Board to come up with rules regulating what we're talking about here and report back to this committee and the Senate Matching Committee on a date certain is that anything that we could be sure would happen? Yeah, yeah uh, this, the, the committees do that with some regularity. Um, and uh, we, would, we would comply with that. Um, we, uh, we, acting as staff to the board, would, would work with them to draft a rule through their current authority. I would want to check in with our attorney and make sure that there's no restrictions on that authority that would prevent us from doing that by rule, but I don't believe there is. <laughs> I have a quick this question. This needs to be last because we have another okay. witness to hear from. Well, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering if the if uh, if this bill were to pass, 
would it indeed impose a, um, a season on kayaks? Because the only time they're worth anything is when their pelts are full. I, that's some. <clears throat> That's something I would ask this committee. Is that your intent? Um, because uh, no, it wouldn't. I, I, I think that if, they, if somebody were to shoot a coyote out of prime and take the pelt, they would not be in violation of this, even if that pelt was not usable um, or not worth anything. So I, I don't know, because <clears throat> I don't know if, if it would effectively do that or not, because you could legally still shoot them any time of year and provided you retrieve them and use them, um, and, and I don't know, I don't just don't know the answer. We'd have to figure that out. As one of the questions, I one of the questions I have. Okay, thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much. <coughs> Mike Cubby. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, I took a couple of notes. Um, sorry, Mike Covey, Executive Director of the Vermont Traditions Coalition. Um, I took a couple of notes while Councillor Grady was up here. Um, the, I'm fairly new to the, this degree of, of uh, creating legislation. But the, the statements that it's not compliant with the North American model seems to me to be um, editorializing and, and to me, that insinuates a need to defend the decision to make a law. So I, I question the value of something that needs to be preemptively defended. Um, and I also found it interesting that Mr. O'Grady couldn't identify why we were not in compliance with the model, um, yet wrote language which made that proclamation into this bill. Um, I just found it a bit odd that that, that wouldn't be established um, <coughs> prior to writing that language in. Uh, so I wanted to note those two items. Um, unfortunately, uh, the broad brush being used by uh, several organizations to paint this as a, as a significant problem uh, not only ignores the simple fundamental truth that a few bad apples don't spoil the bushel, but it strives to deny it entirely uh, by painting over with a broad brush hunters, trappers, and occasionally even anglers as um, there are various terms that have been used, cruel, sadistic, evil, and, and now we're at wasteful. The concept of being non-consumptive is often touted, um, and it's patently false. We need only look at the negative effects of industrial-scale soy farming to further clarify the fact that we're all consumptive users of wildlife by our very existence, as evidenced in a recent article from the World Wildlife Fund, which showed soy farming to be the second greatest cause of deforestation. Um, behind beef. So none of us are non-consumptive. The perceived ills and extent of the wanton waste issue are being driven by a narrative from this sector and we see it when we see leadership of those organizations captioning pictures of say a hunter who's loading his dogs with his children and saying photograph them and shame them whatever possible. <laughs> They're really, truly driving the narrative, and I feel like that's a lot of what has driven this bill. Those statements are made through a lens of cultural superiority, as if somehow by not hunting, people are having no negative impact on our wildlife. And I think that we need to really acknowledge as a whole that we all have that negative impact to some greater or lesser degree. Um, I would ask everybody to ask themselves how, how poorly they thought of hunters prior to the last few years, and how much uh, recent statements have kind of crafted that negative image. So as I've listened to this bill and listened to testimony, uh, frankly, often when I hear the North American model mentioned, it's, it's almost invariably editorialized to either insinuate or directly state that management of an animal for any reason other than utilization is wasteful and abhorrent to the model. That being the case, I went to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's website to see if there was what I hoped would be an unbiased statement of these principles, and I found what I anticipated with no editorial slants, no editorializing at all, simple statements of, of mission. So rather than read all the way through all of them, I will, I will simply skip to 
the fact that this is our wildlife. And, and when we say it's our wildlife, it's all of ours. So it belongs equally to, to hunters, trappers, and anglers as much as the casual observer. And both those groups have the opportunity to work with the department ensuring the well-being of our wild populations. Both those groups are able to enjoy wildlife in their own ways as long as we're maintaining healthy levels of these animals on the, on the landscape. The key is not to maintain every individual animal upon the landscape, but to maintain suitable conditions for those individuals who are not harvested. I'd like to draw your attention to point number four of the North American model. Wildlife <coughs> can only be killed for a legitimate purpose. Wildlife is a shared resource that must not be wasted. The law prohibits killing wildlife for frivolous reasons. That's the entire statement as written on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's website. There's no, no editorializing, a simple statement. And I take that as a mandate for management. I sat in this committee four years ago when I heard a powerful statement made. I'm not sure whatever gave folks the idea that food was the only reason to manage a species. The hunting of coyotes and other predators is not frivolous. In the case of coyotes, it's a metering tool, but it's not a negative population driver. Those supporting this bill urge you to unnecessarily curtail coyote hunting based on the fact that it offends them while freely admitting that it's not a negative population driver. The current management strategy of an open season does no harm and in fact may provide benefits. Current management strategies can mitigate conflicts before they occur. With coyotes already maligned by many, why would we choose a path which increased conflicts when this was implemented in Connecticut? In an email dated February 16, 2017, pardon me, Connecticut DEP biologist Chris Vance stated, the DEP is well aware of the widespread threats of coyotes present to pets, and in very rare cases to humans, especially when they become established in populated residential areas. Although coyote conflicts occur year-round, there is evidence that attacks increase during the spring pup rearing period. Coyote damages are also regularly reported by livestock and poultry breeders in Connecticut, and spring lambing and calving is a period of increased threats and damages. Although difficult to measure, some research has shown that coyotes may negatively impact some game populations. Considering all these factors, the DEP supported eliminating the closed hunting period in, in part of April and most of May to allow sportsmen the opportunity to take coyotes during the time of year that is considered most beneficial in reducing impacts on game species, while also facilitating control opportunities on farms that may be experiencing damages. The DEEP is also continuously working to assist landowners and municipalities in addressing coyote conflicts in populated areas through education, prevention, and targeted control through professional trapping when direct control is deemed necessary. We have this template available as evidence, and that can save us the pains of experiential learning. As the commissioner noted, it seems like this has been, there's been quite a bit of drive to either purposefully or inadvertently to create a closed season on coyotes through this legislation by indicating that if the pelts are worthless, there's no value in hunting them. I think we need to address management and acknowledge management as a legitimate purpose for taking coyotes. As we hopefully determine to acknowledge management as an appropriate and legitimate purpose for hunting, we should put together to rest the crow discussion as well. This committee heard from several folks about the wanton waste rule applied to waterfowl. This rule is propagated at the federal level as part of the Migratory Bird Protection Act. This was first enacted to implement the Convention of, for the Protection of Migratory Birds between the United States and Great Britain acting on behalf of Canada. The statute makes it unlawful without a waiver to pursue, hunt, take, capture, kill, or sell birds listed therein as migratory birds. The statute does not discriminate between live birds and dead birds, and it also grants full protection to any bird parts, including feathers, eggs, and nests. Over 800 species are currently on this list. While about 170 species are considered game birds within the act, only about 60 of those species <coughs> are hunted each year, as the Fish and Wildlife Service has determined that hunting is appropriate only for those species for which there is a long tradition of hunting and for which hunting is consistent with their population status and their long-term conservation. It is unlikely, for example, that we will ever see legalized hunting of plovers, curlews, or the many other species of shorebirds whose populations were devastated by market gunners in the last decades of the 19th century. 
In this federal statute, explicit provisions and restrictions are made to allow crow hunting in all states except for Hawaii. I want to reiterate and clarify that point. The Migratory Bird Protection Act both prohibits wanton waste of waterfowl and simultaneously provides for the hunting of crows. If there is a stronger argument for the fact that crow hunting is not wanton waste and has a legitimate purpose, I can't think of it. A final note to the legitimacy of these practices is the value of keeping people connected to the natural world and active in the field. As we have discussions about the decline in hunter participation, we should be seeking every mechanism possible to recruit new hunters and to retain those already engaged. These pursuits provide opportunities to keep people on the landscape in what is an off-season for many game species. Many is the youth who enjoys calling a few crows with their father, culling the local pigeon population, which are both invasive and destructive, or keeping the local woodchuck population to a dull roar. These pursuits <coughs> hone their skills, provide some degree of pest mitigation to their neighborhoods, and have no deleterious effect on the broad population across the landscape. Most importantly, they keep them active and engaged with the natural world. If we want our youth to carry the torch of conservation, we cannot rely on simple indoctrination. A few years ago, Jamie Fidel of VNRC asked me what my thoughts were on land conservation. My response was teach people to hunt, trap, and fish. Give them something to love. Offer them a place to do it. And you will never have anyone more invested in the endeavor of land conservation. I would say the same regarding quality, uh, water quality. In an era of nature deficit disorder, we should be seeking to expand opportunities to engage nature in an immersive manner rather than seeking to curtail engagements based on the uneasy gripes of a few who are fundamentally opposed to hunting in general and simply seeking avenues to pick away at it. Former warden Eric Noose has been quoted in testimony as having concerns about the wanton waste of wildlife. In fact, on March 13th, this committee received an email containing Mr. Noose's concerns from Holly Tippett, a Protect Our Wildlife supporter. In the quote from Mr. Noose, dated February 19th, 2009, he notes concerns, but he goes on to state that, in the proposed Vermont rule, we explicitly stayed away from forcing utilization. Once you get the animal home, it is your property, and you can use it as you see fit. The concept of harm versus offense is what needs to be decided. Just because someone's actions are offensive is not enough to make it illegal. In a democracy, we put up with lots of offensive things. Meaning no disrespect to this body, Mr. Noose closes with the point that the department, the board, and the outdoor community of the state, being more intimately familiar with and tied to the resource, are most appropriately trusted with its stewardship. He suggests a discussion of rules and he states, it seems to me we hunters and trappers can do a much better job than our mostly non-hunting and trapping legislature can do. In another submission from Ms. Tippett dated that same day, former warden Don Isabel echoes that sentiment. In an oft excerpted email dated April 1st of 2018, Mr. Isabel states, I would rather see this type of regulation come from within the Fish and Wildlife Department than have a legislature sponsor and get lawmakers to pass a wanton waste bill that the department is not comfortable with. I believe it's important that this committee hear that statement as I do not believe it has yet been explicitly excerpted from that piece. These two men have been cited as the mandate for this bill yet neither support legislation but rather rulemaking which Commissioner Porter has testified is already ongoing on a case by case basis. I urge this committee to dismiss H357 to allow the department and their skilled biologists to see to the welfare of our wild populations and to continue with more pressing matters. Questions? Uh, we're in the room with Bob, uh, Representative Ford guy, uh, made a proposal in terms of having the department come together uh, with the uh, I think it was a legislative council, I don't mean to put a word in his mouth, but mine was, I didn't quite get it all, but there was the idea that they come together, that they work more or less with, with through a committee and try to come back with, to us or to the legislature with something more, well, considered, he considered more viable. How do you, how, what's your opinion? I, 
I think that that's a good start. Um, I, my testimony was written prior to the current draft of the bill based on the previous draft from last week. So, um, and, and it was written previous to today's testimony. So there's some overlap there. Um, and I don't think that's a bad approach. I do think that, that I think that there, we're see, we've seen testimony a couple weeks ago and then again today from the commissioner that as the rulemaking process occurs on various species, they've been addressing wanton waste in a species appropriate manner. And I think that has probably more value than trying to generate a blanket piece of legislation. Um, legis a blanket piece of legislation would be very uniform. Conditions in the field very rarely are. Conditions in the field tend to be different between species, significantly different between species being pursued, and often different uh, simply based on conditions. Who would you include in that discussion? Would you include organizations such as yourself as well as uh, folks who are into a, a more non-consumer, non non-hunter uh, organization? I, I would hope that stakeholders would be included in that conversation. Um, that would be my expectation. That's why I believe we have hearings. That's why I've been asked to testify today. So I would hope that, you know, continuing in this discussion, yes, I would, I would expect stakeholders to be included. Thank you. about how important it is to ensure that we we are clear about who's, who's making that determination on what is considered wanted. We, we heard about how do you determine reasonableness, and, we, we, and that language came from federal statute under the Migratory um, Bird Species um, Act. And, and in lieu of that, we provided explicit um, elements that describe what that would mean. And uh, and I think we're, we're um, working on what those findings ought to be to help describe that this is not about hunting, it's about those bad apples or those, um, you know, that type of poaching that we're trying to avoid. Um, and so I only want to make a point that I think it's it's a market improvement. I think what we heard today is, um, especially from the commissioner, that there are some other considerations, and I'm I'm hopeful that the commissioner sees that this is heading in the direction where there can be a collaborative spirit working with the commissioner to ensure that this is meeting their expectations. I, I understand that the the commission isn't necessarily tracking annually wanton waste, which is unfortunate because you always want to have evidence-based data to drive policy always. But we do have some uh, historic information about that and um, from the very um, wardens and staff from the Fish and Wildlife Department, and which if I mean, you look at, gosh, the majority of other states having something in the books. I think there's an opportunity there, especially because when we're dealing with um, those things that we didn't foresee 100 years ago, whether it's um, that black market trade with rare endangered species and, uh, and the struggles when you rely on a 
rulemakings are species specific, you, you lose that opportunity to be more nuanced. So I, I'm looking forward to that collaborative effort with the department to ensure that that what is being proposed here is actually going to benefit the department in their actions to be the stewards and the deciders on um, how to uh, ensure that this type of poaching is um, serious and um, and we're being responsible from a uh, state perspective. May, may I make uh, one, one comment? I know it's a little bit out of order, uh, but I've been thinking about it since uh, the end of our conversation. Uh, Lewis Porter, Commissioner of Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, given where we are in relationship to crossover, uh, I would just submit the committee could consider directing the board to do a, a rule, a regulation around this, and come back next year. Given the crossover deadline, it doesn't, doesn't seem likely to me that this will go through all stages of passage this year, so I don't know that you lose time because of that. So just something for this committee to consider. <clears throat> so you're saying that um, you would commit the time to try to promulgate a rule before next session? We, we, in the, we in the board are the legislators, legislature's partners in, the, in these policy issues. And so if you do direct the board and the department to devise a rule and return to you with a rule, uh, it, I would suggest returning, given the length of time it takes to go through LCAR and ICAR, I would suggest returning to you in January with an update on where that rule stands. Uh, you would still have next year's legislative session to amend, move, or build. And uh, just can you please speak to how um, the uh, how Sorry. you would engage the public in that rulemaking, and that how would the organizations that um, are in this room today be able to participate? In that? Any action by the board includes public input, public comment, public hearings, particularly on an issue of this significance. Uh, we would tend to do more. I mean, we are doing, we do a couple of dozen public hearings uh, every year on different rules that we that we promulgate. Um, we would certainly do a number of them here. The committee would be certainly able to direct uh, or recommend or or tell the board what kind of public input they wanted to have. But we do public comments and public hearings, all of which are recorded. Uh, you would record the comments from them and re react to or sort of responsiveness summary to them. Um, in addition, we have instituted in the last few years a comment period at the beginning of every board meeting, working board meeting. Those are restricted to two minutes per person just because the board meetings, you know, the board has to have time to do its work also. But we have extensive public comments on any rule. So um, I guess I just want to be clear that I have this right. Um, back in 2008 9, when you have the working group and then I, it's my understanding it was actually really well agreed to, and then the board rejected the um, changing rule on this. You know, I wasn't with the department at that time, but I believe from talking to folks that were that what happened was we, we were we were close to an agreement, and then various parties, including perhaps people within the department, had issues that resulted in us not reaching a consensus on that. I don't think it was board action to reject it. I believe it was a the 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 working group wasn't able to come to a consensus. I may be wrong about that, not having been party of that conversation, but that's a, that's my understanding of what happened. Thank you. Any other comments? Not just for Lewis, he's joined us for the discussion. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's fine. It's very helpful. Um, Representative Lewis, if we decided to go the rule route, is this something that can be expedited quickly, or is it something that's going to be long drawn out process like the last time it, it, it will i think it's important that this be a process a long enough process to address the issues and to provide for that public comment in addition we have a pretty heavy rule docket over the next year including a total rewrite of the deer regs right. add to that the the uh, apa and statutory requirements on the length of time that people have to comment going to icar going to lcar you know, it's a lengthy process. What I would recommend is that the is that the committee have a check-in with us when you return in January, and at that point you can say, no, board and department, you're moving too slow, or you're going in the wrong direction, or we don't like something about what you're working on, and we're going to do it through statute. 
I don't think you'll lose time given that we're after crossover, but I, I don't know the details of that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Just a quick question. Would it be helpful for us to urge you through a bill to um, go through rulemaking? Uh, we, you, the, in the past, the committee's done it in bills. You've done it in just by filing a letter to, to us and to the board uh, asking that we do that or telling us to do it, let's mm -hmm. be honest. Um, so I think either one of those paths would work. Is that like a memorandum of understanding that would exist between us and your department in terms of what you promise to do and what we expect to receive? I think uh, I think that an MOU would probably uh, would probably diminish your authority. Um, in the past, it's been a letter that says the board and the department are a creation in part of the legislature. Go do this. Uh, please, <laughs> Representative McCullough has written a few of those, um, and uh, and we will do it. I, I can't promise that we will have a finalized, finished rule by January because of the time that it takes to go through the rule process, particularly something complicated. But but you could outline in that letter, uh, and and we would be happy to react to drafts of that and tell you whether we thought that was reasonable or not. But I, I don't anticipate that being an issue. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if it's an if it's an MOU that we have to agree to, I think that diminishes your authority a little bit. So the present of the bill alone, sitting in reserve, to be taken into action at any time, would be uh, the uh, instead of do or the stick you need to uh, get us something. We we would make our best effort. Like I said, we spent two years on this unsuccessfully, so I can't promise success. I can promise you our best effort, and I would suggest that a letter outlining what you're looking for would be an effective guide to us. So alternatively, <clears throat> it's happened in this building that um, issues of particular difficulty get worked out among the stakeholder groups, potentially with a facilitator from our committee. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you could support? Absolutely. We've done that in the past. Uh, I think we can, we can make that work. It, it, <coughs> it adds a level of complexity. Uh, in terms of develop, you, you developing the process and obviously adds a commitment by somebody from this committee to, to be engaged in that process. Um, but we, we, I, I believe we've done that in the past also. So that's another approach. And then return to you with a rule or return to you with a statute or, or whatever the, that group decided. Um, I've seen that process play out successfully. It does add you know, rather than us developing a proposed rule and going to the board with it, it does add an additional step, but that's up to you. You mean to say? No, I, <laughs> 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 I, I've, learned, uh, I've learned after a few years not to mention the other body. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we, we would have that kind of task force working group at the front end and then it would go to either a regulation or a, or a statute so it adds an extra component that's beyond we would still do a regulation process which included all the public input and all the APA requirements so it, it would add it would add some time and add some process to it but that's not necessarily a bad thing does that make sense yeah uh, one more the, the, um, yeah I, I'm thinking, sort of the way I understood the, the chair's question, I, I could be wrong, is that would you support a, a working group for this legislation and would you participate in it and likely with our council um, to create a compromise and appropriate legislation titled H357 that moves forward through the process. Sure. That, that, that's somewhat different, I think, than what you were kind of just saying. So, yeah. I, that, that's what I thought you said first, and then, yeah, good. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> we, 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 we work in concert with your direction. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry to, to extend your time Thank there you a little. Um, we're going to take a 10-minute break. Thank you. Come back and switch gears. I got my bill. Um, what I want to make you aware of is yesterday we took testimony on slate quarries. You know that. Friday afternoon we will hear from the Natural Resource Board attorneys on how slate quarries are administered now. We'll have Ellen walk us through the proposed language 
in the committee bill, so we will be following up on the slate quarries, and then we will have to have a conversation about how, if and how we want to include them in this legislation. Today I've asked Ellen to go through the changes we asked her to do for administration and appeals. I think we will also, by time next week, hear from Judge Grierson. Yes. Um, about the administration through the courts. Um, so just <coughs> know that that's on the on the docket to use the court language. And um, so today it's our hope to walk through the draft. Like I said, the proposed changes from the other day, and then move to climate change. If there's time, we will probably have a long. <coughs> we'll have a lot to do on the floor today, but it may not be long. It depends on the amendments. So we are scheduled to start 10 minutes after the floor again this afternoon on whatever wherever we left off on Act 250 with Ellen. Did I get everything? <coughs> yes. Great. <laughs> okay, with us. Um, yeah. And I unfortunately have to leave at 11:10 for a brief bill presentation. So. All right, Ellen Jaikowski, Office of Legislative Counsel. I'm here on Act 250, and we are on Draft 6.1, as we made changes to the last draft. So it is on your committee page, and it is um, posted, so you have hard, you have hard and you have hard copies. And that's of the whole. Bill, not just what we've talked about. Correct. It okay. is now. I, I should have a copy. I want to go five point. <laughs> yeah. Well, five point three contained only a small handful of changes. Yeah. So there are more. There are quite a few changes in this draft, and they are highlighted in yellow for Great. your easy identification. So this draft is the, is as far as we've got to this point. Is that correct? This. It's, 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 it's comprehensive to the fact, the fact that where we are in the bill. The discussions we've had and the changes we've made yeah. are going to be represented in this yep. draft. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. It also contains things we haven't discussed. I did ask her to make a couple of things that we we have not discussed altogether as right. a group, but that we've discussed in here. Yeah. So we can try them. The appeals language uh, related to the, the, the new board starts on page 14. And what we decided on Friday was that the, the Vermont Environmental Review, Review Board shall consist of a chair, four members, and two alternates. And so I'm on line seven of page 14. The chair, members, and alternate members shall be nominated, appointed, and confirmed in the manner of a superior <coughs> judge. The chair shall be a full-time position. I, I was unclear if we had decided just the chair would be full time or if any of the others were going to be we just the chair. We would try the chair full time. Okay. And uh, so then the next edition of language is on page 15. Initial appointments of the board shall be made so that the terms of the chair and the members expire in a staggered manner. The initial appointment of the chair shall be for a term of four years. The initial appointment of one of the members shall be for one year. Another shall be for two years. Another shall be for three years. And the final member shall be for four years. The, ter the term of each appointment subsequent to the initial appointments Question. Shall be yes, four years. Um, I'm I'm questioning the the uh, the manner of staggering with the initial initial one being one. Did 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 the committee 
decide that one year was okay for the first one or was too short? Because that question did get raised it, by me, by the way. But I'm, I'm just not sure where the committee was on, on that. What was the original? The original um, it was to be determined. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the, the previous statute. I think, it, I think it was still to be determined, yeah. Well, he means when it was. You mean the original, the original, original bill? Yeah, original as it is bill. now, how did they get appointed? Yeah. <coughs> so what, what, it is, is one good, starting out with one? Representative Forget. I'm the one that's, that suggested one, two, three, four. I think it's good in that I follow, follow the initial appointment, the one-year term is limited for a short, for a short term. Right. But what you have to look at is the future. You've got to get through these first four years, and then everybody's going to be on a four-year schedule anyways. Yeah. Good, good. Yep, perfect. They also can apply for reappointment. Yep, good. Good, enough. good. thank you. On, uh, I'd like to go back to page 14. Sure. And, uh, you know, and just in terms of what we have, since what we are doing is a change in what is present, I would like that to the, be more or less highlighted. It. Like a Vermont Environmental Review Board replaced, will replace the Environmental Court in terms of either hearing act of 50 appeals. I would like that up front so someone knows looking at this bill what we're doing with this, what we're doing with this, uh, with this review board. Um, that it is going to be, it's going it's to it's change how the act is, uh, how the act is, uh, is administered. And I just think it should be up front. I don't think uh, there's nowhere, in the, there's no indication whatsoever that that's what's going on here. And yet, we're making very, uh, rather, rather, I would say, a very transformative uh, change. Sure. So I would uh, direct you to page two. Um, so page 14 amends. <coughs> 10 BSA section 6021 mm -hmm. and all the language that's stricken in that on that page will not appear in the printed statute um, and so it will perhaps read a little bit better but on page two at the bottom of page two the purpose of this bill is to replace the natural resources board with a Vermont environmental review board which would hear appeals from the district commissions and the agency of natural resources in addition to the NRB's current duties. The environmental division of the Superior Court would continue to hear enforcement and local zoning appeals. So, so the, the intro section to your bill, the purpose section, does contain a more direct statement, but the actual mechanics of amending the statute, um, page 14 just starts with the establishment of the board and the duties of the board are further on. Um, so it, if you'd like to add something on page 14. Um, I guess I, I have a question. The bulleted items, it's been a little unclear to me this whole time. Are they really a purpose section that would be in, this, in the um, session law? Because it doesn't, it doesn't actually, it says the bill proposes to make, but it, normally the language says the purpose of the bill is to, so I think that's a clarification. The, the, the bullets, I think I asked for them earlier just to help us find our way through the bill in a regular way and know like, oh, these are the big things that are changing, which I think does address your concern, mm -hmm. except if, I just want to know, is it, would this be in session law the way no. it just would be in purpose? So if we wanted it to be, we'd have to change it. Yes. To the purpose. Yeah. So, like, when we're looking at it on the floor, after, say we pass this bill, would these bulleted items be there? They appear at the beginning of the the, the bill as pr as printed. So probably not in the calendar, but when you discuss it, you. <coughs> they, they appear, the purpose section is on every bill that is printed as introduced. Um, when it gets 
put into into um, the books at the end of the year when when things are passed, that is not included. But there but an uh, there's an act summary. Yeah. And where is the act summary from? Those are compiled separately uh, in what the the act summaries for everything passed. Yeah. yeah. So, so in in subdivision A on page fourteen, you could add more, but the structure of it currently is just that it is establishing the board, who it, who it, who um, is on it, and then and then it gets into what it does. Representative McConnell. So then, to build on the on the vice chair's kind of question, rather than just moving on. Um, First, asking you, and then, and then, depending on your answer, asking the committee. Uh, on line six, mm -hmm. page fourteen. Um, um, instead of what we have there, a natural resources, which is scratched out, which gives us a little hint about what's going on, um, and because later board is not scratched out, would it? Would it be appropriate to say, um, and 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 uh, Paul, you you may need to help with this because it was your idea. But the natural resources board is is out of business, <laughs> um, and the the Vermont Environmental <laughs> Review Board is created. The NRB is is is. Out of business, then <laughs> verb is in business. I don't know quite how to word that, but is it would it be appropriate to, to make that statement complete there? No, no, but we but what we could do on starting on line six, we could say establishment the Vermont uh, Environmental Review Board is created to hear appeals of decisions by the jurisdictional coordinate uh, by the district coordinators and commissions and and conduct rulemaking on behalf of the agency or we, we could put it right there why don't you try it on to the next iteration okay. we'll have, a, we'll have an opportunity to do what we have. Yeah. in lieu of I think it's better than out of business but <laughs> so, oh, <no. laughs> What would, the, what would you put as the reasoning? <coughs> I would just caution against leaving sort of um, ghosts of past. You know, when a statute is, is um, amended, you don't usually leave remnants of what was there before. Right. We want to get rid of. We want right. to get rid of the NRB and replace it with. Yeah. In our thinking. Um, in your, in it, so. I just don't want to leave the uh, impression that this is all, this is settled. I think the question still remains as to whether or not the, uh, the new uh, environmental review board will replace uh, the environmental board. I mean, we've had testimony on from both sides, and it seems like it's still, still at play. And, I, and, I, and the way this reads to me, it, that's no longer now an option. I just wanted to make it, you know, to, to, to give some uh, uh, indication that it's still very much alive in terms of what we do. But what's up? Well, whether or not the, uh, the environmental court should stay in, in place and keep its present well, that's, status. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. We've had testimony now from uh, four judges. We've got a judge coming in next week to testify on it. So. You know, I just kind of, I don't want to preempt that possibility. And that I'm point. worried that the language does that. that but I'm kind of a little more, I, I must say, I'm a little, you know, if, if we do it in an iteration, if we do it in the next draft, so and that, that decision is to go with, the, with what the bill is now proposing to do, then it'll just disappear. But I don't want to disappear right now. I'm so, I'm sorry. You confused me. So, so you're concerned that this language suggests that we're 
uh, disbanding the environmental court. Correct. So, so the, this is this is just dealing with the establishment of a board. Right. The pages um, down in the f if starting on fifty nine is when we uh, start talking about um, the court itself. So, so the court is is still in set. We're not deleting any of the court establishment. Um, we're just we're taking some of the powers and adding it to this board. Um, I'm sorry, where are you at now? So well, so I'm just just <coughs> talking. So the the appeals process in this bill is broken up into two areas, which is we are creating a board and giving them powers, right. and then later in the bill we are taking those powers from the court while still leaving them with other powers. It's, and those two things reside in different parts of the statutes. They're in, they're in different statutes. Okay. So on page 15, um, I did just want to make sure, line 16, that we had decided on four-year terms. I actually had written down both four and six years, and I wasn't quite sure what the committee had decided on. I think we hadn't decided, but I, I would I would suggest the four-year terms as opposed to the six-year terms because it would tie in with one, two, three, four. Yes, uh, on the existing one. How does it address it? How did it address it? There was, I believe, in the <coughs> six years. Was Does anybody have a, have a So the existing board that yeah. exists, they are they serve four year terms and the, the chair serves at the pleasure of the governor. And that's all it states, not the setup of it. So it is for it's four year terms currently. So. In uh, in the wording here, and you, you just brought up an issue that I don't know if it's listed anywhere, uh, indicating that the chair um, serves the, 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 this the initial appointment of the chair shall be for a term of four years. So is there anything in here further that indicates that the chair serves at the pleasure of the governor? No, the board that you're creating now, the the chair does not serve at the pleasure of the governor. They're okay. appointed by the judicial nominating board. Okay. So then the next change is on page 18. <coughs> so this is the section about the board having the power to retain personnel. So regular personnel, the board may retain legal counsel, scientists, engineers, experts, investigators, temporary employees, and administrative uh, per personnel as it finds necessary in carrying out its duties. And I changed the following language to clarify based on what we discussed last time. And may authorize the district commissions to use funds to retain personnel to assist on matters within its jurisdiction including oversight and monitoring of permit compliance. Personnel employed by the district commissions shall not report to the board. Um, so we did have a conversation last time about if a district commission wants to retain an expert and then that uh, decision by the district commission is appealed to the board, whether or not there's um, a conflict of interest that could arise 
So uh, I did attempt with this language to sort of wall them off. Uh, personnel employed by the district commission shall not report to the board. Um, so that was my attempt to address the concerns of the committee. So you're trying to remove any appearance of conflict? Yeah. Right. Anybody have any questions on the question? The district administrator is a full-time person at district commission, so has no reporting requirements to your current. So the district, uh, the district commission is made up of coordinators and a district chair, and they are trained by the board and overseen by the board. And I, I don't know the exact nature of that. Um, and so I would maybe want to check if report is the correct word with the Natural Resources Board, if they have an opinion on that. But currently, there is a relationship between the district commissions and the board. Um, okay, so that I think so those are the only changes that I made based on our conversation from Friday. language in uh, graph 5-2 when, uh, when we uh, started on page let's see uh, we talked about appeals uh, what was it? 59 sure so the, the rest of the appeal section starting on page 59 um, we discussed on Friday and we did not make any changes Most of it is language that is carried over from existing language. Yeah. Um. goes all the way to page 77. That section goes from page 59 to 77. to uh, jurisdiction environmental division mm -hmm. um, what I, I think what I get out of this section is that, that that's the environmental court and this is what they're going to be left with is that is that right to say after we bifurcate yep okay That was shorthand. After we create the verb and pull a bunch of stuff away from from the in our current in our. 
Yep, so the way that the, the Vermont <coughs> statutes are laid out, the judiciary has its own section and it's not in Title 10. So the environmental division of the Superior Court, its powers are in the judiciary title. So that's what um, starts on page 72. <coughs> so. So currently, there is a judicial. There is a list of uh, names from the judicial nominating board, and that list <coughs> is then. So what happens is um, the, judici the judicial nominating board seeks um, applicants. They. Uh, compile a list of people that they believe to be qualified for the, for the position and then that list is then provided to the governor the governor um, then uh, selects a name or in this case a few from the list and then uh, asks the Senate to confirm uh, the selection The, uh, a minor point, but on page 81, uh, we wanted to change the date as well as 2000, it's 2020 now. To? I think it had to be, uh, uh, I, I, certainly that date is becoming increasingly tentative uh, as we are <coughs> more than halfway through 2019, so maybe we should make it less, less certain. Uh, I don't know if we need it in the draft, but I'm just calling your attention to the fact that it's there. It seems like, uh, sure. Uh, On the, w w it's okay. line six. Okay, for the budget? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sure. What page is that? It's on uh, 81. 81. Oh, 81. Yeah, the, the dates in the effective date section will, um, there will be sort of a, a waterfall effect of it. Yeah, and all the way down the eight. Yep. Yeah. Yes, um, it's a normal. When we last talked, there was a section, I don't know exactly where it is now, that talked about the fees for an appeal. Mm -hmm. It was something like two. It's up to 295. You're going to check that out to see what would be appropriate for this. Uh, well, so currently the fee, the fee for filing an appeal with the court is $295, and this bill sets it for filing with the board for $250. Um, I don't have any research on that. There are differences between the administration of a court and the administration of a board. Um, and so you may want to take testimony. Um, there are policy considerations about sitting, setting a, a fee at high you, um, because then it bars who can appeal. So as it but is, we're going to just leave it here then. It's 250 or something. I mean, it's a nice, th that number sounds somehow familiar. <laughs> <laughs> what did the uh, chair indicate that she uh, asked you to make changes that we can change request and you made changes uh, sure so I haven't um, seen you all in a few days um, but I understand that you may have heard testimony related to the road rule so I have added the road rule it's on page 7 
and I am not an expert on the road rule. I can only tell you a little bit about it. Um, the road rule was repealed in 2001, but it was a different jurisdictional trigger. Um, and so it adds. Did <laughs> you say that again? It was repealed. There was a road rule. And 800 feet. Yes, it's in re there was a road rule. I'm going to perhaps ask this question, my answer to be verified by Greg in a moment. But uh, previously, there was a rule. It was in the, the environmental board's rules related to when an Act 250 permit was needed for a road. And it was based on 800 feet. So um, that rule was repealed in 2001, and I have added the text of that rule to your jurisdiction section back on page 7. <coughs> so it reads as follows. The construction of improvement for a road or roads incidental to the sale or lease of land to provide access to or within a tract of land more than one acre owned or controlled by a person. For the purposes of determining jurisdiction, any parcel of land which will be provided access by the road is land involved in the construction of the road. This jurisdiction shall not apply unless the road is to provide access to more than five parcels or is to be more than 800 feet in length. For the purpose of determining the length of the road, the length of all other roads within the tract of land constructed, constructed within any continu continuous period of 10 years commencing after July 1, 2020 shall be included. So if you are going to construct a road 800 feet in length or more within 10 years, it will require an Act 250 permit. Um, I don't know. I'm sorry I walked in. I just have one thing to say, you know, which is that I asked for this, and I don't know if you were able to. I don't know, wait. I don't know how you introduced this one. She didn't uh, that. Okay. Yep. I just wanted you to know that that was my request, and it was um, somewhat based on testimony that we had taken um, around it. And it is, for me, in my mind's eye, for consideration around, you know, we're we taking testimony around forest fragmentation that. <coughs> Depending on who you talk to, maps are a good idea to use or they're not a good idea to use for jurisdiction. And this is another possible tool to use in addressing um, forest fragmentation, uh, possibly in lieu of using maps. Representative Odie. Um, I'm also concerned about forest fragmentation, and I'm wondering if you've got an 800 foot trigger you could how long can a driveway be this would, this would cover driveway. it does cover driveway i i did a personal analysis of driveway lengths and i i um thought i put it up in my shared file so i could share it with all of you i will look again but there's a, a pretty good spread of um, driveway lengths um almost up to a mile that is in it's not it's not it's not a perfect data set, but there is a in the E911 data set there is a list of them and you can get a kind of a rough estimate of um, private road driveway lengths that are out there in the universe. <coughs> The old road rule. Well, this is intended to be the old road rule. I asked Ellen to just grab the old road rule so we can start with that. Okay. <coughs> is that what it, that's what it is? Yeah. Okay. I feel as though we heard testimony from the last biennium. 800 feet is pretty long and this really, it really digs into the forest. So I wonder if it's too long a road. I mean, why do we have to go back to the old if what we know now is? We're fragmenting forest. <clears throat> yeah. What was the rationale for <coughs> taking that out in the first place? It was in the original, and when it was taken, what was the reason? Uh, that would require a, a bit more research. Um, it was done in 2001, which is a bit 
was a while ago. Any information on that? Right? I have a little bit, and I could certainly provide more. My understanding was, or is, and I, no, I wasn't around either at that time, but my understanding is that the board um, and I think inter interested parties as well found that this particular rule was difficult to administer um, and in some instances created track or created projects that, um, in order to avoid the rule, um, it created projects that were that that set up like um, uh, uh, parallel roads on parallel projects, it, just in order to avoid the road rule. So in fact, some people believe that th that this version of the road rule may have led to more unnecessary impact on forests, um, and and that coupled with the with the difficulty in administering the, the rule, uh, the board felt it was appropriate to. Uh, to strike the road rule, nothing's come up in its place in the in the you know interceding 20 years. Um, but it, you know that's just a very cursory overview of the road rule. I'm happy to do a little more research to, to find out the specifics. Yeah, would um, I would also just add that w upon the repeal of the road rule, that the the subdivision threshold was lowered, so that previously uh, 10 subdivision uh, set 10 lots triggered the subdivision rule, but now it's been lowered to six um, to sort of part of Right. So it lowered it, I think, in or I was reading last night to sort of compensate for this, tr this loss threshold. Uh, Kate McCarthy. Good morning. Kate McCarthy with the Vermont Natural Resources Council. But what I've heard, I was also not around at the time of the road rule conversation and negotiation. What I've heard is consistent with my understanding. I would add that one of the reasons that the road rule may not have achieved its goals is that, as written, it includes only roads and not driveways. And so assuring that cumulative impacts are addressed means making sure driveways are also included. Um, I, I, I could be corrected on that if someone else knows differently. I, I, I thought, it was, I thought the, the definition included. Did you find a definition of road in there, Ellen? Did not. So, so that but requires some more. Uh, Brian Schuch from the NRC can speak more to this. Um, if, if driveways are not included, you could have had a road with many things going off of it and causing issues. What year did you say <coughs> it was repealed? 2001. It's also not cumulative, was it? That's right. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it, it's all other roads constructed within a t continuous yeah. period of 10 years. Just again, Greg Bobo, okay. uh, as far as witnesses are concerned, you, you might also be interested in contacting Lou Dory, who was the oh, yeah. former executive director for a number of years at the Natural Resources Board and also a former district coordinator. So he had the practical experience of, of actually applying the former road rule. And he was also around as an administrator when the road rule was, was repealed. So I think he'd probably be able to provide a lot of um, important historical insight. Boring. Uh, B O R I E. I've got an email address. I can that private roads and driveways have on municipal road infrastructure. Uh, in particular, uh, when municipal, when private roads and driveways, especially at 15% um, grade, are delivering runoff onto town municipal infrastructure, town ditches uh, and um, culverts, it can silt up the town infrastructure and blow them out during um, flood events. I'm thinking, you're nodding your head is, and I'm wearing my 
the former select board have, we saw that time and time again. In fact, 50% of, of the road miles in the Mad River Valley are private roads and driveways. And many of them are at 15% grade. So this bill tries to require municipalities to adopt road bridge standards and it updates the road bridge standards to include a private road curb cut standard. I only raise this because it's more than just fragmentation. We're concerned about certainly how to minimize those cumulative impacts on town infrastructure or on water quality, especially in, in headwater areas or uh, tributaries. Uh, it's it's the, those sorts of impacts we should be considering as well. And um, so regardless of the length, maybe the length makes it um, that much more of a capability to, uh, for at least for Act 250 purposes, to create a threshold of jurisdiction. But I just throw that out because it's more than just fragmentation. It is about um, addressing and supporting municipalities and how they're trying to manage their own road network when they could in fact be um, seeing major impacts from the siltation caused from the run on from private road subscribers. Um, for sure, it, those, those are issues that that are really water quality and important issues. Um, but with the is, with the concern at hand for the next iteration of the road rule, um, I'd like to keep it in for the next iteration. Um, I think um, Kate McCarthy's. Uh, comment about uh, driveways, what is a road and what is a driveway, is a real concern. Um, uh, and and uh, But we do need more testimony and, and, and we've got a good source on that we're going to ask um, about that. Uh, uh, I, I, and just comment, during the Shorelands debate, Roads versus driveways was an issue, and we had to somehow delicately work with that. I don't remember the details, but um, so I look forward to 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 um, Greg. I'm sorry. Who did, who did you recommend? Lou. Lou Borey. Yeah, Lou Borey. I look forward to Lou's testimony around around everything that Greg mentioned, and and I'm sure it'll address the driveway issue and the other issue of uh, about a shorter road with lots of little driveway extensions and so on. <laughs> so I want to keep it into the next situation. Be, be a, a, lot of, <laughs> a, a number of towns, uh, um, following up on uh, on a number of towns have accepted standard uh, highway construction policy part of a, a way of getting additional grant money on, on road construction. So uh, how that's one time with this, I don't know, but there are some standards out there. Any other thoughts on this before we move on? I've got one question so far as uh, composition of the board, and I know we've already talked about this. Uh, should there be anything in there to indicate that the chair plus the four members, other members of the board, are all voting members. In some cases, the chair is not necessarily a voting member, and I don't know if you should be anything in there spelling that out or not. Yeah. 
question, Bob, is whether or not it's a or the, or the, or the, there should be spelled out in here. Oh, yeah. oh, sure. In some cases, right, right. the chair is only allowed to vote to make, uh, to make or break a tie. And I don't mean to hold everything yeah. up, but that's something, something that it should be in it. I know um, from being on the hearing officer for the Public Utility Commission at one point in my life, the, um, the board chair was a board member. Fundamentally because they're small, typically they're relatively small boards, mm -hmm. and their input is, is important to provide that kind of chair type of perspective. So it's never been a need, unlike a legislative body, I was going to, I can look, but I suspect that the, so the, the board adopts rules for the procedures, um, and so I suspect that is probably in the rules, not in this section of the statute, but I, I will, I will check. So you would say the board itself will determine if the chair is a woman member or not? Right, like they would establish their procedures for deciding a case, and you could decide to put that in statute. I'm looking for it right now. And I suspect right now it's currently in their rules, but I yeah, will look. I will look. <coughs> to start with climate change would you like to start with the criteria or um, you know last time I walked I walked through the language of all of it starting with the amendments to the capability and development plan as well as the relevant definitions and then there's the criteria I think that um So we didn't make any changes um, based on our last conversation. Um, it starts on page three. So I guess the question is, since, since we've done the walkthrough, we did make a fair amount of testimony on the climate change sections. Um, I don't think we need to <coughs> read everything here. Um, but if you can just summarize what we're doing here, summarize it, and then if folks have stuff they want to discuss, now is the other time. Yep, so just, yeah, by, by way of review, the Capability and Development Plan was adopted in 1973, <coughs> so a, cu a couple of years after Act 250 went into effect, and it's 19 further legislative findings, and so it's, it's more detailed than the original findings in Act 250, and they're not criteria, but they're sort of the, they describe what Act 250 is supposed to be used for. So this language, starting on page three, adds a new finding related to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. So it's adding a, um, a statement that Act 250 should be used to address climate change. So I was wondering, would it be, um, would you be able to 
pull up for us to look at the other 19 that already exist? Uh, sure. It, um, yes. One of the one of the pieces of um, testimony we got suggested there might be a, instead of just tagging us onto the end that there might be a more uh, appropriate place for it up higher in the list. So I wanted to look at that. So it is, uh, if you have your binders nearby, oh, yeah. it's printed, I think it's Appendix 2. Uh, it might be appendix. Uh, it might be appendix three, though. <laughs> uh, no, no. Okay. Uh, let's, whoop. Yeah. Also, I mean. Uh, so let's see. It's also in. I know, but they are. It's also list. They're listed in the report. They're listed in the report. Also, the full <coughs> text is. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's Appendix Five in the report, but they're also listed on page. No, no. They're in the Act Two Hundred and Fifty. They're actually listed in the Act Two Hundred and Fifty report on page ten. Here are the, the the short summary summary of the capability and development plan. Um, <coughs> I love this report. Let's get everything. <laughs> well, at any rate, I, I guess the, so, the high level discussion is to focus support adding in a statement about climate change <coughs> in the capability and development plan. So Carol Maud, anyone else? Yes? Yeah. Yep. And um, at this time, if um, nobody has any... Oh, just, I, I mentioned this before, and I just wanted to just add it again. So it's um, well, just not a simple thing. In line 12, to put safety and safety after human health. <clears throat> sure. So that it would read, climate change poses serious risks to human health, pub public safety, or human or health and safety. Common. Human health and safety. Okay. Human health and safety, functioning ecosystems that supported diversity of species and economic growth and Vermont's tourist, forestry, and agricultural industries. Human health and safety. Okay. Uh, it, is that an, 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 a change? It's good with me. If anyone has any opposition to that. I'm good with it. I, I, I like it. Explain it. Explain it. It doesn't okay. need to be explained. <laughs> so on my last two uh, versions, I have I wrote we were going to change to public health, and now my oh. second one I have public health, so I don't know. Yeah, maybe that makes sense. Okay. Human public health, health and safety. Public health and however, yeah. I just had that written down. Yeah. Even though public health? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Or just instead of human health and just say public health and safety. That, I guess that sounds better. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Health and Putting safety. it up there. Well, the only thing that I would say about that is that might not take into account that individuals are impacted even if a whole community isn't impacted if they are located right. it's not just public health yeah <coughs> human health right yeah well i i just assumed when, you know, when you say public safety you're talking about any one one person yep. that's typically people raise that concern but if you think that that's not fair or not i'm open to <coughs> On line 19, where it says ensure that the design, uh, what will that be based on? Will they be benchmarks or criteria that will more or less um, have in it and, uh, designs that do what we intended to do? Or how, how do we go about that? How does someone know that he's complying with it? Yeah, so that is a great question. And I think, and can we have? 
can we hold it until we get to the criteria part because it's just there? But I think that's a great question. Okay. Depending on how we address it there, we may change this. All right, fine. So I would just say that these these are the goals, and Act 250 is the tool to achieve those goals. So this is the statement of the goal, and then the text of the statute is what you use to achieve the goal. So this is a, a statement of the goal. Did we come down on <coughs> line 12 exactly? Um, health and safety, human health and safety, um, or public health and safety? That's a question. Um, so do you know what? what uh, I'll pass those down to him. Did you pass that down to him? Um, it, it seems to me that the issue was raised that um, public health and safety uh, was good and I immediately bought into that and then the idea that public health might not public health is the greater public maybe versus an in, individual people's health and so I don't know where we landed on that as a committee for direction to, to, to you Ellen do you know where we landed on that I wrote down risks to human health and safety. Um, I, I think that you could wordsmith it either way. Um, I, it was just I think human was in, was used to differentiate between the the sort of biodiversity that's in the next okay. comma. Yep, that works. But, for me. Yep. works for the committee. Um, and then on page four uh, is another is an amending is amending one of the existing findings. So so yeah. So the first one adds a new one. This is amending um, one of the existing ones to add ecosystem protection. Um, so. Uh, I don't have any notes on this one either. Um, there was a, we did discuss it previously, um, but again, this is one of the sort of policy statement goals that Act 250 would be used for. So it's ecosystem protection and utilization of natural resources. Actually, no, it's, yes, the bottom of 32 is criterion one. So to review, this draft um, takes the existing uh, criterion one, which currently contains both air and water pollution, and it separates out water and houses it all in criterion two. And so criterion one is now um, solely about air pollution issues. Highlighted is that we added the phrase greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so 
so that criterion one now reads air pollution will not result in undue air pollution in making this determination the district commission shall at least consider the air contaminants greenhouse gas emissions and noise to be emitted by the development or subdivision if any the proximity of the emission source to the residences population centers and other sensitive receptors and emission dispersion characteristics at or near the source uh, line three starts criterion 1a air contaminants a permit will be granted whenever it is demonstrated by the applicant that in addition to all other criteria the emission if any of air contaminants by the development or subdivision will meet any requirement under the Clean Air Act 42 USC chapter 85 and the pollution control regulations of the Department of Environmental Conservation and then we didn't make any the next change is on page 34 so I don't know if you want me to read keep reading through but um, there's a small change on page 34 question before we oh sure we left it already before we left that that long list of the um what's in the um <coughs> capability capability and development plan is you know you were wondering about what order we might put things in and then i was looking at it and also thinking you know we put something about waste but there's something about recycling there's other things that this committee as a natural resource committee could think about putting in that in that list. Yeah. Yeah. It might be worth spending some time thinking about that. Would you be willing to do that? And give us some suggestions back. All right. If anyone else is saying something. Perfect. All right. There's a there is a section in the report about the capability and development plan if you want to read a little bit more about it. Okay. To start your research, <laughs> I just was trying to help you. Thank you so much. Um, so, so criterion one B is added to um, on greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so slightly different than air contaminants, and it adopts uh, avoid, minimize, mitigate. And on page thirty four, we added language to line seven to read um, the sub the development or subdivision will employ design and materials that are sufficient to enable the improvements to be constructed including buildings roads and other infrastructure to withstand and adapt to the effects of climate change including extreme temperature events wind and precipitation reason reasonably projected at the time of the application so we've taken a fair amount of testimony around this because we had a lot of questions about it and i, I just would say that um, i learned a lot about how the agency of natural resources is evaluating the life cycle impacts of solar developments for example and just <coughs> reminding the committee of of that because we sort of went down a path and explored what's happening now and um, it's uh, what's happening with the energy code which we that's related to all this but we took that testimony as it relates to the climate change suggestions in this bill and um, we learned about the passive house for example which is one version of a net zero house we tried to get a clarity on where we are as a state in moving forward on our goals around um, renewable energy and um, net zero standards. Um, and so that, that's the part of the testimony we've taken that I want you, you to apply your mind to when we're thinking about this language. And I guess I think this is um, great and aspirational language. I don't know if we are ready to codify it put that out there for the committee to consider. I know you want to speak. Representative Cohen. I didn't mean to interrupt you. 
crazy <laughs> Sorry. Go, I didn't. Go for it. Um, I was actually hoping for a response to what I said. Yeah, and it yeah. was a response. I, I appreciate that outline because I, I went back to um, some helpful testimony by um, Richard Fasey, who talked specifically, I think we asked him some, um, some homework in terms of better understanding this and, and as you know I my line of questioning was on how do, how would that this language be interpreted so it was really helpful for us to, to kind of um, dive down into what that would play out and you may recall I was thinking and um, as to whether we needed to encourage a rulemaking process yeah, to that to help flush that out, or is this adequate enough? And um, and what I had heard from both the testimony of um, the National Resources Board <coughs> that this new appeal structure <coughs> will better enable the board to make technical decisions that are going to be relevant to future decision making on key matters such as this new one and, um, and that they, they had some on that database that they showed, they had some hundreds or so technical decisions that were influencing and providing a, a capacity of the board to be able to calibrate the eyes and the decision making authorities of the district commissions in such a way of being able to build on that. Um, so that gave me confidence in recognizing that this, a new appeals board can really help to support this, number one. And number two, the combination of, of Richard Fazy's testimony and information that he provided indicated that this approach of, um, as described in here, uh, avoid, minimize, and mitigate is workable. And he... Um, had some examples in which, just for minimization, for example, was would be where you would um, hope to see a maxim, maximization of energy efficiency, um, for example, where he referred to the void as how to drive a, um, a net zero to help whoever the landowner is to retain their, their um, um, use their building to help save their money, save money in the long run. So that all gave me confidence from being able to dive down into the hearing the testimony that this could this is a workable approach without feeling that we had to micromanage the process itself to drive um, to flush out what that would mean. So I just wanted to kind of appreciate that ability for us to have that line of testimony because it gave me confidence that this is a workable approach. Representative McCullough. Um, what I think I heard was, uh, to, to your query, um, yes, we ought to do this, <laughs> and, and, and that the process will work itself out through, through decisions and appeals and so on, but um, I, I think that's what I heard, and, and, uh, and, and I would additionally add that, that we must be putting this type of new criteria in in order even for it to be considered. If it's not in, it won't be considered. And we must start considering these types of, of uh, issues uh, how, as we, as we would need to adapt to climate change. Representative Bates, Lefebvre, and then we adjourn for lunch in order to put the pressure on. Well, um, I'm confused here. Well, I'm a lot confused now. So I'm looking at, under line 20 about the criteria, air pollution, right? And we're adding greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. Does that get added into <coughs> the criteria then, like what I'm reading here? Does that get added back into the air pollution criteria? I don't, I don't know what you're pointing at. I'm looking at all the criteria, all yeah. the something, everything. It's yep. So then greenhouse gas would then get added to the existing air pollution. 
because it talks about noise, it talks about all that stuff. Yeah. But it doesn't say greenhouse gas, so you will add that into that. Got it. Now I get it. We, we have it if we agree to that. Look, I, I understand it now. Thank you. Yeah. Representative Lafayette. Uh, my only comment was uh, in response to what you had to say earlier about whether or not we're there yet as far as indicated the criteria goes. And I think uh, a lot of that is, you know, I mean, what's desirable or uh, there's also a gap between what's desirable and what's <coughs> possible from an economic point of view. Well, I think some of the testimony, yeah, the wrap group there was very, very illuminating, but it also was a costly and funds to make the, uh, the, the passive house. Or, so I think what you projected there is, is basically does have to have some sideboards on it as far as cost goes. Uh, and it's like a whole other conversation. I, is that what you referred to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I okay. think um, we will adjourn for lunch and hopefully we haven't seen each other again 10 minutes after the floor this afternoon. Thank you.